simply terrific. Thank you very much. Now, it's not really unusual to hear uh, a modern piece involving the marimba as a solo instrument, but I believe that you actually arrange Bach for the marimba, mm -hmm. and that seems to me quite extraordinary. It's hard enough to play with ten fingers, never mind two sticks. Well, yes, I can understand that. Actually, I, I can use two sticks, but I can also use four sticks, ah. so I can get a lot of the harmony and the counterpoint and things like that. Um, but really, in Bach's day, his type of pianos were much more like the sound of a marimba, slightly drier, mm -hmm. without the pedal and things like that. And um, so, really, not all his works actually can be transcribed or arranged for marimba, but a lot of them can. But and how how difficult is it for people to accept Bach for the marimba uh, without just regarding it as a, as a musical curiosity? Wow. I think, first of all, they need to accept the, the marimba aspect, and so you need to have the balance of actual marimba literature as well as arrangements, um, arrangements of Bach or other pieces, light-hearted pieces or serious works. Mm. Um, but it, it is surprising um, how well Bach works. I mean, a lot of his fugues, for example, don't work because it's difficult to sustain the inner parts. Um, it just isn't technically possible. But um, it's surprising how today's techniques opens up a whole new world for marimba players as far as Bach's music is mm. concerned. Now, when you began uh, as, a, as a musician, you were deaf, and people naturally regard you as a musical curiosity in a way, uh, just as they regard uh, Bach on the marimba mm -hmm. as a curiosity. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're gradually, of course, being accepted, as we've said, as a virtuoso in your own right. But how much does it make you a bit fed up to have the deafness coming first before the music in people's minds? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I suppose I get a little bit fed up maybe now and again, but um, actually even when I started percussion, my aim was really um, to get percussion to the forefront, to get oh. it in front of an orchestra, and that's my problem in life, or my challenge rather, yes. um, is to get percussion accepted. And somehow at the beginning, um, people have latched on to the fact, well, here's a deaf musician, and um, so they've been interested in the deafness as opposed to the percussion aspect but now um, the musical aspect has taken over and so they're they're much more interested in what percussion is about and so when they go along to a concert um, really they want to return because of the music mm. and because of the, the the sounds and things like that that can be achieved as opposed to seeing a deaf musician play of course but well, are you saying in a way that you've succeeded in spite of your disability but you've also succeeded because of it <laughs> I don't know, gosh, I have a long way to go, maybe. <laughs> but um, I, I really don't know. I mean, every day I'm in encountering something that's new to me when I play. Mm. Um, uh, little, little challenges that um, I think, well, these wouldn't happen if I had ears to hear with mm. properly. Um, but then again, you see music and you hear music in a whole different way. It's not a new way, it's just a different way. And in fact, it's the same way, I suppose, um, as what Beethoven experienced. And I think maybe we don't really think about Beethoven enough. I mean, here was a man who lost his hearing late in life, really. Yes. I mean, he was a, an adult, and uh, but yet he produced some of you know, the most wonderful music ever. Yes. And despite the fact that he couldn't hear mm -hmm. applause and things like that, um, he could actually tell if the second violinist was playing a wrong note by the fingering, mm -hmm. things like that. And he knew the instruments inside out. Well, he, of course, in the Heiligenstadt document, he said that, it, that he was in the greatest despair when he lost his hearing. Mm -hmm. When you were 12 and knew that you were, you were becoming profoundly deaf, how did you feel, Evelyn? What, what did it do to you inside? It's a difficult question because everything was so gradual in a way, um, really from the age of six mm. upwards. Um, but at the time, um, when I was wearing hearing aids and things, I wanted to hear everything as you or someone else would hear it. I wanted to hear the notes I produced as notes. And um, I have perfect pitch, and so I know exactly what notes sound like. And, um, but 
the more or the louder I played, the more distorted the sound was. And sometimes I'd even miss that particular mm. frequency. And so really I was losing my balance, my coordination and things like that. And I had no feeling for the music at all. Everything was loud. Mm. And of course with percussion, it's very physical anyway. Yes. Um, so it was easy to really play bang something. It, yes. <laughs> bang it, exactly. <laughs> and um, I mean to the public really, percussion is about hitting and banging. Mm. And so it's, it's my job now to really um, produce the poetry of percussion. So what was it that made you feel the music through your body? When did that I, happen? Well, um, I was becoming so frustrated and not being able to hear the actual notes. And my percussion teacher, Ron Forbes, was particularly good and patient in that um, as far as tuning timpani was concerned and just being a very delicate player and knowing the weight and things mm. like that that you need to use, um, he suggested that I play much, much softer but try and feel the vibrations, mm. feel the sound mm. as opposed to hear the sound always. In an orchestra, what happens if you are playing, uh, playing away happily and then you hit the wrong note, which must happen many times, I should imagine, with any performer? Well, I think it would happen more so if I did a solo recital as mm. opposed to in an orchestra. Mm. Um, but, oh wow, I mean, you, you go into the recital feeling as prepared as you can and hopefully there aren't too many wrong notes. But hoping, I mean, hoping they don't notice. <laughs> well, I think the art of a musician is to be able to conceal the wrong notes. <laughs> but no, okay. it doesn't. I, I can see it and you can easily tell, I yes. mean, really. And then if a conductor, without naming any, if his beat is not very clear, not mm -hmm. very precise, mm -hmm. Do the orchestra then follow you? I mean, are you leading from the back? Because you're right at the back of the orchestra. Oh, um, I really try to lead with the orchestra and the conductor. Mm -hmm. But um, I must say there was one instant, instance in Hindemith's metamorphosis, symphonic metamorphosis. And um, there's a section where really it's just a percussion section. And it's a fairly syncopated bit. And um, however, the tubular bell player is the only one on the beat. And um, I, I happened to experience this work once, and I was a tubular bell player. <laughs> and I was playing on the beat and trying to watch the conductor at the same time. And he told me that um, I was either speeding up or slowing down. I was just off the beat. And so it was really creating havoc within the section. And so we tried it again. I really looked hard at him this time, but he still, you know, accused <laughs> me. And so I said, well, really, could we possibly try it um, where the, the percussion section look and listen to the tubular bells so that I'm the only one on the beat. And so if they're hearing something and yet seeing something different, there's no way we're going to be right. So we did that and Fortunately, it was okay, but I mean, he felt really quite awful, so he stormed out of the hall. <laughs> but Evelyn, it was interesting. One of the most extraordinary and fascinating things about you to me is the fact that you're sitting here talking to me as anyone would who had their full hearing. Now, you cannot hear what I'm saying at all. So, mm. when did you learn to be quite so adept at lip reading? For instance, I know that if I were to say to you, Get our body wheel, Lassie. <laughs> you would be able to say where I came from, wouldn't you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do it? Well, first of all, um, I, th I really believe that someone has either got a flair for, for lip reading or they haven't. Even hearing per people can learn mm -hmm. to lip read. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately, I enjoy it. I mean, apart from the fact that I have to do it, I actually enjoy people. I like the one-to-one -one correspondence, things like that. And it's not just the lips, it's the whole face, it's the whole movements and mm. things like that. So for example, if you were to turn to me and just go something like, or, <laughs> or, yeah. A lot can, can be told with the facial expressions, mm. Mm. but um, accents is one thing to conquer, um, being aware of an accent. So, I mean, your Glaswegian accent is much different than what you would normally speak. <laughs> you know, it's only anyway, one of many. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Tell me something, Evelyn. You strike me as an exceedingly determined person, I and mean, you've had to be in, over to, in order to overcome the problems that you've got. 
Well, my problem at the moment is percussion, is to try and get it recognised, is to try and um, broaden the repertoire a bit and um, to reach out to people who are that high or mm. that age, you know. How much did your family support you when you said you wanted to be a, a musician, to make it a career? It must have seemed an extraordinary ambition for them. Not really. I mean, it was only in my later school years that I really wanted to be a musician because I liked other things as well. And um, so when I, you know, stated that I, I wanted to study music, then they, um, my mum in particular, happened to say, oh, well, really, you ought to think about doing something else just because of the music business. Mm. It's, it can be a fairly hard business. There's a lot of tough guys out there. Uh, but she wasn't in any way concerned about the, the hearing mm. problem and music at all. She really didn't think about that. Can I ask you a very dodgy question? With all the advances that ha there have been in surgery uh, of recent years, mm -hmm. it is very possible that you might just be able, if you were prepared to, mm -hmm. to get some of your hearing back. Would you want it? Well, I haven't been, although there have been great advancements as far as um, the medical side is concerned, I have had a couple of friends um, who have had implants, but they've been completely deaf, and um, they've the end result is that they've been able to hear a little bit, but nothing really substantial enough. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I've experienced music in a totally different way and in a much more personal way, in a way that I enjoy playing, in a way where I can really hear the instruments, not just through sound, but through feel and have complete contact with them. And I'm not influenced by anyone else's performances either. Um, everything is my own and really I'm quite happy. Evelyn Glennie, thank you very much indeed and every continued success. Yeah. Would you like now to play something else for us before we have lunch? Well, I think actually it may be interesting seeing as we talked about the, the transcriptions and arrangements of Bach music um, is if I played a little piece by Bach, um, he's written 48 preludes and fugues, so I'm not going to play them all, but um, there's one in particular, number 21 in B flat, that I think works particularly well. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Evelyn Glennie. incredible talent and the incredible story of Evelyn Glennie.